Thank you. Thank you, Steve, and thank you all for coming out here on such a rainy, terrible night when we're getting ready to get a whole lot of snow. Uh, but we'll go to a visit a nice warm place, and that will make us feel a lot better. Um, oh, I got yelled at for that the last time I talked here. Okay. Is that, is that better? And I won't move very much? <laughs> Okay, so we've, uh, in our wonder series, we've traveled around the world, as Steve said, um, seeing a number of wonders. I believe that the series kicked off this year with a discussion of another wonder from ancient Egypt, the Great Pyramids. That lecture was given by David Silverman, our curator in charge. And so tonight's lecture will also be taking place in the land of the pharaohs with the discussion of the pharaoh's lighthouse at Alexandria. This is, as Steve uh, mentioned, a topic that is near and dear to my heart. Um, in addition to being completely fascinated by ancient Egypt, I also am a bit of a lighthouse fiend. Um, as you can see, this interest is one that spans a long time. If you note the different hairstyles and hair colors, <laughs> that becomes quite clear. Um, some of you also know that I do have a fascination with Egyptian kitsch, um, and some of the objects from my personal collection are seen here. Second to my Egyptian kitsch collection is probably my lighthouse kitsch collection. So these are some lighthouse objects in my house. Um, so it's a nice tying together of several of my, my interests tonight. Um, I think for many of us, just the idea of a lighthouse is something that is completely fascinating, whether it's an ancient lighthouse or a modern lighthouse. And when we see in newspapers today discussions of events around lighthouses, like the move of the Cape Hatteras Lighthouse in North Carolina that took place a number of years ago, where they had to move the lighthouse from its original location here on the shoreline where it was being threatened, um, they had to move it quite a long distance to a place uh, where it would be safer. Um, and I watched this, um, not in person, but followed it very closely in the news and was very happy to go see it when it was in its new spot and that we weren't looking at a pile of black and white bricks at the end of the project. Um, and lighthouses, I think, have a sort of romance um, about them. And there are a number of books, novels that are um, romances set in, in lighthouses or around lighthouses. Um, so I think, you know, we can argue that the lighthouse is sort of a fascinating, um, a fascinating subject. For tonight, we will be dealing with a lighthouse located in the northern part of Egypt, in the Nile Delta, up here in, in the city of Alexandria, uh, located right here. But before we tackle the lighthouse proper, let's talk a little bit about its location and you know, where, where it was, how it was described in ancient texts, um, and what we can say about the location of the lighthouse was that it was placed on, was built on the, an island, um, which was off of the main coast of Alexandria originally. Originally, this was an island separate from the coast. Um, over time, land built up between the mainland here and this island. Um, and in fact, then a, a road um, was constructed during the Ptolemaic period, leading out to the lighthouse and other um, establishments in this area. But for the history prior to the Ptolemaic period, um, this island was separate from the coast. And it was described, we find it described um, in Homer, in the Odyssey, where it is said to be the home of, or the location of, Proteus. Um, who was described as the old man of the sea. Um, he lives on this island. And we find um, in, the, in the story the description of the island itself, the name Pharos comes from a mishearing, a misunderstanding, when the question is asked, whose island is this? And the answer is it's Pharaoh's island, meaning it belongs to the Egyptian king. This was misunderstood, and Pharaoh's 
was understood as the name of the place. So this is how we get the name for the island where our lighthouse comes to be located. We further see the description um, in Homer um, of this location, an island in the heavy wash of the open sea in front of Egypt, and they call it Pharos. So this is our location. This is where our lighthouse is built. Um, and so we see it um, described here in this text. Um, and so from this sort of humble island, um, basically in the middle of nowhere, we will come to find this wonder of the world being constructed um, as a, a beacon to the city of Alexandria, which becomes uh, the jewel of the Mediterranean, uh, becomes one of the most important cities, if not the most important city, uh, in the ancient world. In fact, the name, the word Pharos, the name of the island, the name of the lighthouse constructed on the island, um, becomes the word for lighthouse in many languages around the world. You can see some of the examples here, all of which are derived from Pharos, um, our island and our lighthouse. Um, and in fact, many companies today um, have borrowed this name, Pharos, whether it's talking about a lighthouse in general or using a reconstructed uh, image of what the Pharos lighthouse at Alexandria may have looked like, they borrow this image. Um, and it's sort of understandable, lighthouses guide the way, they're a beacon, they're a beam, they can help you sort of see into the future. Um, and so all sorts of companies, you know, take on uh, this, the idea that the lighthouse has behind it. Um, there are some wonderful depictions um, in Western art of what the lighthouse at Alexandria may have looked like. These pictures are um, painted by, engraved by people who had never been to Alexandria, had never had a chance to see the lighthouse itself, and are basing their illustrations partially on their own imagination and partially on perhaps descriptions in ancient texts. Um, so here we see a 16th century interpretation where we have the island, here's the road leading out to the island in a sort of this curvy fashion, um, very tall tower, round sort of spire. Um, and here we have the king um, planning out his, his city. Uh, here another, the same, basically the same scene going on, um, the king being shown plans for the city, the lighthouse in the background identified as Pharos up there in case you weren't sure what it was. Um, again, very fanciful sort of illustration. Um, here is another version. Um, we'll give you this one, which is in color, that's basically the same um, from 1756. Um, doesn't really look like the Alexandria that we might imagine there was in um, ancient times, um, but there you have it. Uh, this one is particularly nice, looks a bit like a wedding cake of sorts. So very imaginative and completely inaccurate um, illustration of what the Pharaoh's lighthouse may have looked like. If you travel around our country or around the world today, you can find many replicas um, in many different sizes of the lighthouse at Alexandria, buildings that take as their inspiration this, sit, this lighthouse that was constructed um, in Alexandria. So here you see the George Washington um, Masonic Memorial um, located very nicely in Alexandria, Virginia. Um, and it, it has as its tower behind, um, it's reconstruct, it built to look like some of the reconstructions of the lighthouse. Uh, there is also a lighthouse of Alexandria in this um, park in China. We also see the Sheraton Hotel in Georgia on the Black Sea being constructed to look like some of the reconstructions of the lighthouse. So I think you can see how this lighthouse, how this wonder of the ancient world has entered the popular imagination and how it speaks to people around the world and has for centuries. In Spain, there is a theme park um, that has as its uh, design, it's focused on different parts of the ancient world, and there's a part, of course, about Egypt, and you can float past 
a, a tiny version of the lighthouse in a little paddle boat. The lighthouse has been constructed um, in sand and sand building competitions um, out of Legos. So here are two different versions um, in Lego. If you are like me and suffer from a lighthouse kitsch slash Egyptian kitsch problem and you frequently go on eBay, you can find quite a number of different kinds of objects that bear representations of the pharaohs of Alexandria, um, including a thimble, um, a silver bar, uh, a Zippo lighter, um, a phone case, and this pelican pen that will only set you back about $3,500. It's available on eBay right now. Uh, the lighthouse has been featured on postage stamps from around the world. Um, it has been the subject of children's books, this wonderful story about this young boy who accompanies his father as a sailor, um, and he gets to see and climb the Lighthouse at Alexandria, very nicely illustrated um, book about the subject. Um, the surrealist painter Salvador Dali in the 1950s painted two versions or visions of how he viewed the Lighthouse at Alexandria. Um, in the city of Alexandria itself, the lighthouse, while it is no longer there, is sort of an omnipresent symbol um, of the city. And we see the, the flag of Alexandria, of the city itself, bears an image of the lighthouse, which you see at the top here. The um, seal for the governorate of Alexandria um, in Egypt bears this image, which we will see a little bit later when we talk about um, contemporary depictions of the lighthouse from uh, ancient times. Um, and here from the University of Alexandria, there the university logo or seal or symbol bears an image of the lighthouse. So we see how it has entered popular imagination, um, how it speaks to us, has spoken to authors and artists over the years. But now I think we need to turn from the idea of the lighthouse um, to the actual lighthouse, or what we can say about the actual lighthouse and its um, origin, construction, and what have you. So now we are looking here um, at a Google Earth satellite image of the city of, of Alexandria today. Um, you will notice um, here, this is Pharos Island, which is now very much connected to the, the coast. Uh, we have two harbors uh, in the city, which we had in ancient times as well. And so this area here would be the location where the lighthouse was constructed um, in ancient times. The royal quarter of the city in the Ptolemaic period was located in this area here, and the ancient city itself probably encompassed an area um, in and around here. So this is, of course, you know, much more modern sprawl. Alexander the Great is very closely tied to our story of the pharaohs. Um, Alexander, as you all probably know, um, conquered Egypt in 332 BC. Um, he was essentially met by the Egyptians with open arms who were happy to welcome him in and to, as a, a liberator. They wanted to be rid of the Persians who had been controlling Egypt and had been controlling Egypt quite badly. Um, and so he marched into Egypt with basically no resistance at all. Um, and once there, he does a, a series of things um, that will sort of set the ball rolling for our, our lighthouse. Well, one of the first things he does when he um, arrives in Egypt is he makes a trip to the Siwa Oasis. Um, as you may know, Alexander was quite interested in oracles, prophecies, dreams, and took a lot of, um, a lot of things he heard in those oracles or in those dreams to heart. When he visited the, the temple of Amun at Siwa, he was greeted by the priest there and welcomed as, as the son of Amun. 
And Alexander took this to mean that it was sort of destiny that he be the one in control of Egypt. It was divinely ordained. Um, and we see here, whoop, oh no, what did I do? Uh, an image of um, the god Amun, a form of Amun. Um, Amun in ancient Egyptian representations can take a couple of different forms. Sometimes he's shown completely in human form. He wears a tall crown on his head with two tall feathers. Um, but he could also appear in the form of a ram, um, which you see here. And in fact, later images, representations of Alexander um, on coinage, he bears the ram horns connecting him to Amun of, of Siwa, his divine, um, his divine father. Uh, after this um, episode or encounter in Siwa, um, he also wishes to found a new city in Egypt. Um, and he has a dream. And again, as I said, he, he puts a lot of, of faith and a lot of stock in prophecies, dreams, oracles. And in this dream, he sees an, an old man, a wise old man, who says to him, now there is an island in the much dashing sea in front of Egypt. Pharos is what men call it. Now, you all heard those lines, or lines very similar to that at the beginning of this talk. Alexander was a, was a well-educated um, individual, and from his dream, he recognized the words from Homer um, and wanted to visit, wanted to see the location of the pharaohs, and understood that this might be the place where his new city should be constructed. When Alexander travels to the area um, of the island of Pharos. Uh, there isn't much there um, to be seen. There is a small um, fishing village, it's often described as, by the name of Rakotis, or Ra Kedet, um, and here you see the hieroglyphs for the name of that. And it's in this location, um, in the area in the vicinity of Rakotis, that he decides to um, have the city of Alexandria uh, built. Um, he himself does not stay uh, for the building of the city. He doesn't you know, come to see the lighthouse being built. He doesn't come to see the city flower in the way that it will eventually, um, will it, ha it will happen. Um, he appoints um, a, an architect, a city planner, who is responsible for basically laying out the city, planning what the various elements of the city will be. Um, and as you can see from this plan here, the city had um, a very regular grid system um, with a main, a main street going through um, the city. And again, as I said, the, the Royal Quarter located in this area here. Here is our, our road, our bridge out to Ferris Island, and there is the location of the lighthouse, or what will be the location of the lighthouse. Um, again, if you look um, in Western art, you can find uh, depictions of this moment in history. Uh, so here you see Alexander um, founding um, Alexandria, deciding uh, where the city will be, what, you know, what will be a part of the city. Um, and sorry, it's cut off at the top there. It says, put a lighthouse over, over there. So as I said, he doesn't stick around. Alexander does not stay in Egypt. He sets up um, administrators uh, to govern on his behalf. He is nominally the, the, the ruler of Egypt, but he is not resident um, in Egypt. And as we know, um, he then sets out over the next essentially 10 years no, a little less than 10 years, um, for his sort of world conquering, heads off to, to the east, um, has the, the famous confrontation, the battle against the Persian king Darius, um, and eventually comes to amass an enormous empire um, stretching you know, all the way from Egypt um, all to as far as India in the west. A tremendous amount of land, a tremendous amount of area um, that he is the, the ruler of or the leader of. Um, his life was unexpectedly cut short. Um, he died um, 
again, it's not certain of what um, he died, perhaps a fever, um, in Babylon in 323 BC. Um, and this painting, this uh, illustration here, shows him on his deathbed surrounded by his generals and surrounded by his advisors, his bodyguard. And these individuals will be quite important for the history um, that follows because after Alexander's death, his empire does not fall to one person. Rather, his various generals divide up the territories that Alexander had amassed, and each of them governs a certain territory. The territory that interests us is, of course, Egypt, and that area falls to um, his general um, and friend that he had basically grown up with, um, Ptolemy of Lagos. Ptolemy was, like Alexander, um, a Macedonian um, origin. And so Ptolemy gets the prize of Egypt in the division. And he will become the founder of the Ptolemaic dynasty. He will become the first king um, of the, the Ptolemaic dynasty. All of the Ptolemaic kings very conveniently or very confusingly all have the same name. They're all named Ptolemy. So on one hand, it's very easy to kind of say, oh, King Ptolemy did this, and King Ptolemy won that battle, and King... But in order to help us distinguish amongst the various Ptolemies, they all have um, official nicknames or epithets. And Ptolemy I is known as Ptolemy Soter. Soter means savior. Um, and as I said, he is the first king of the Ptolemaic line. And it's under um, Ptolemy Soter that we're going to see Alexandria, um, the construction of that city, you know, begin to happen, begin to bloom, begin to come to fruition. One of the very interesting um, things that happens after the death of Alexander, remember he dies in Babylon, and the plan was to bring his body back um, to be buried in Macedonia, um, where he was uh, born. Um, and we are told of this tremendous funeral cortege that begins to make its way back to um, the homeland. And um, en route, it happens that Ptolemy I arranges to have the body of Alexander stolen. He essentially kidnaps the body of the king and brings it back to Egypt with him. He now has the prize. He has the body of the great conqueror um, in his possession. Um, and that kind of puts him a little bit ahead of the game with respect to the other generals who are controlling the other parts of Alexander's empire. He has the body brought back to Alexandria where it is entombed. Um, the location and the question of where is Alexander's tomb is another whole lecture and a half in and of itself. Um, but nevertheless, the, Alexander was reburied in Alexandria um, at the beginning or during the reign of Ptolemy I. And not only is this sort of a, a coup for Ptolemy with regard to his fellow um, generals, it's also in good um, Egyptian practice for the, the, the current king to take care of the burial and pro provide the funeral rites for the previous king. Now, typically in Egypt, this is a fa father-son um, sort of situation, uh, but occasionally it happens where it's not a father and a son, and we can see this um, here on the walls of the burial chamber in the tomb of Tutankhamun, where we have um, I, the successor of um, Tutankhamun, here carrying out the opening of the mouth ceremony. Here is the mummified Tutankhamun. So by Ptolemy stealing the body of Alexander, He's following in good Egyptian precedent. And this is something that is probably particularly wise for Ptolemy to do. He is a foreign ruler um, in Egypt. He is not of Egyptian background, but he is governing a very large Egyptian population. And one of the things that the Ptolemaic rulers tried to do, and tried to do quite consciously, was to um, appease or make peace with the native Egyptian beliefs um, and so they were very good at um, opening temples to Egyptian gods, following sort of traditional Egyptian patterns of kingship on, on one hand, while also maintaining sort of um, 
Greek traditions on the other. So there's this conscious blending of the Greek and Egyptian traditions. So it's during the, the reign of Ptolemy the I that the construction of the lighthouse begins. But it isn't completed during his reign. It's completed during the reign of his son and successor, Ptolemy II, or Ptolemy Philadelphus, um, whom you see here. Um, at the same time that the lighthouse is being built, there are other amazing um, institutions being constructed in the city of Alexandria, including the Library of Alexandria, the Museum of Alexandria. And as we know, the Library of Alexandria becomes the learning center um, in, the, in the ancient world um, until its um, unfortunate demise uh, after a series of fires uh, throughout its history, um, each of which seemed to be one worse than the next, um, ultimately it was destroyed probably around 391 um, AD. And now today, when you um, go to Alexandria, you can visit the new Library of Alexandria, this um, very amazing um, and unusual building here located right on the, on the harbor there in the city. So we know that the, the beginning of the construction of the lighthouse happens during the reign of Ptolemy I. It's completed during the reign of Ptolemy II. But I'm sure there are a number of other questions that are running through your head, like what did it look like? I showed you all of these sort of fanciful depictions of what the lighthouse may have looked like. What do we know for sure? And unfortunately, the answer is, not a whole lot. <laughs> um, but we will now try to pick through um, various types of evidence in order to help us understand um, how this lighthouse may have looked. And there are a couple of different avenues for um, investigation. So we have um, written descriptions of the lighthouse of Pharos Island. Um, and we have these from contemporary classical authors, and we have these from later Arab authors, travelers going to Alexandria, um, and other um, writers who were contemporary with the lifespan of the, um, of the pharaohs. So on one hand, we can look at written descriptions of what the lighthouse looked like and what it was all about. And then we can take a look at objects um, or buildings or other things that depict the pharaohs, um, things like coins or mosaics or terracottas, and using both of those um, avenues come up with um, a, an image of what the lighthouse may have looked like. Um, one of our descriptions of the lighthouse and the descriptions of the location of the lighthouse comes to us um, from a man who was very familiar with Alexandria and very familiar with one of Alexandria's most famous um, inhabitants, Cleopatra the Great, Cleopatra VII, um, Julius Caesar. He writes about Pharaohs in his descriptions of the civil wars in Alexandria. When Caesar um, first meets Cleopatra, there is a, a problem going on, a battle for the throne between Cleopatra and her brother, her younger brother. Um, and Caesar kind of gets involved in this, um, this civil war, and there are battles that take place in and around Alexandria and in the harbors there in Alexandria. Um, so what we find um, in his descriptions, um, you can see here, he talks about the importance of the location of of Pharaohs, both the island and, and the lighthouse. And keep in mind the purpose. What is the purpose of this lighthouse? You have now this enormous city that's being built. You have what has been described as very rough seas facing the city and these nice harbors. And so the lighthouse was necessary to sort of help guide ships coming into the harbor um, and, you know, kind of controlling traffic in and out of, out of the city. So he tells us, in des describing the battles here, how important it was, if you were going to win the battle, to hold Pharaoh's Island and to hold the lighthouse itself. Um, and so he describes how he and his troops, and he talks about himself in the third person, um, how they occupy 
pharaohs. They seize the lighthouse, and that kind of puts them in, in a good position. Um, we see other descriptions of the lighthouse. Um, for example, in Strabo, um, he describes how it, it, it looked. Um, he describes how, who built it. So it was believed um, by many Egyptians and Alexandrians to be built by Alexander, the son of Philip of Macedonia. Um, and he goes on to kind of describe a little bit more about that. Um, he gives us a, a de depiction, a description of how the lighthouse looked. He said, it is admirably constructed of white marble um, with many stories, and it bears the same name as the island. So we have the Pharaoh's Lighthouse and Pharaoh's Island. And he tells us who is responsible for the lighthouse. Um, and it says, this was an offering made by Sostratus, um, a friend of the king's for the safety of the mariners. And he alludes to the fact that there is an inscription on the lighthouse that tells us this. Sometimes when you look at descriptions of the pharaoh's lighthouse, Sostratus is described as the architect of the lighthouse, but that is really not certain. Um, it seems more likely that he was um, the, the benefactor, the person who helped pay for the construction of the lighthouse. He was a very wealthy individual, and rather than you know, being responsible for the design, he paid for the building of it. Um, so we get this information um, in Strabo. We get a, another um, bit of information about the construction of a lighthouse and allusions to um, Sostratus in this uh, text here by Lucian, who says he, Sostratus, built the tower on Pharos, the mightiest and most beautiful work of all, that a beacon light might shine for sailors over the sea. And he tells us, Lucian tells us, that Sostratus sort of did this sneaky thing. He knew that the king, King Ptolemy, uh, would not, would want his own name written on the lighthouse, inscribed you know, in a big, um, a big inscription there. And so what he says um, Sostratus does is that he had his name put on a, you know, on a, inscribed on a plaque, had it covered with plaster, um, and had the king's name sort of put on the plaster part, but then over time, the plaster falls away, and we see, lo and behold, the name of you know, Sostratus there instead of the name of the king. And we, uh, we see the um, inscription. Um, Sostratus of Nidos, the son of Dexiphanes, to the divine saviors, for the sake of them that sail at sea. So it is um, done by him in honor of the, the divine saviors for you know, people so that they will have safety um, at sea. Um, a slightly later description of the lighthouse again describes its um, remarkable appearance, how amazing um, this structure is, how it is extraordinary, um, how it is so large it's like a mountain. Um, so we're getting, a, you know, putting together pieces of what um, it, this may have looked like. If we jump ahead even further um, in time, we have a very thorough, probably the most thorough description of the lighthouse at, at Alexandria um, by the tra Arab traveler um, Abu Hagag al-Andalusi. Um, he visited the lighthouse, and in his text, in his descriptions, he gives us a lot of information. He describes walking around the island itself, um, entering the lighthouse, going all the way up to the top of the lighthouse, and he describes how the lighthouse looked. He gives detailed measurements of each of the components of the lighthouse. Um, he says there's an inscription there, but he can't read it. Um, he, said, he, he knows that there's a high door on the lighthouse, which is sort of an interesting, um, an interesting observation. And then he says that at the very top of the lighthouse, there is a mosque that was built. So perhaps at the time when he visits, it's no longer functioning as strictly a lighthouse, but has been used for another function. Um, and we see this happening with Egyptian monuments and other parts of Egypt as well. Probably the best known example is um, the mosque in, uh, in Luxor Temple, which was built atop the, the temple there um, because the temple had been buried in sand. Um, and nowadays when you visit, the, the mosque itself is like 20 feet high up in the air. 
Another thing that we can get in looking at the written descriptions of the lighthouse is an idea of how much it might have cost to build a structure of this size. Um, and we have reports in Pliny um, of what the cost was. He says it's 800 talents. Um, looking at the, the cost of silver uh, this morning, which is coming in at $16 an ounce, um, one talent is 928 ounces of silver. Someone might want to check my math because it's not my strong suit. But it seems like that's about $12 million um, in modern uh, in modern terms as far as the cost, which seems like a complete bargain, actually. Um, how tall? This is another question we might have. I told you that we have the description um, of the various elements of the, of the lighthouse. Um, estimates place its height between 393 and 450 feet tall. Um, so that puts it just a little bit shorter than the Great Pyramid at Giza. So it's, um, if you look at all of the, the wonders of the ancient world, I believe it would be the, the second, second tallest. Now, in some of the um, texts, the ancient texts describing Lighthouse, there are a few exaggerations um, about its height. So one report tells us that it's um, over 1,800 feet high. Uh, which would make it even taller than um, the One World Trade Center that you see here. So somewhat impossible to even imagine that that could be possible. And to put it in perspective, looking at some modern lighthouses, these are modern lighthouses that are remarkable for their size. Um, we have the lighthouse at Ile Vierge in France, um, which is the tallest stone-built lighthouse in the world, um, and that one clocks in at 271 feet. So even if you look at the lower estimate of 393 feet for the lighthouse at Alexandria, um, you know, it's still a, a bit taller than the current tallest lighthouse we have standing in the world. Um, and if we think of lighthouses in the United States, um, the tallest one um, in North America is, is Cape Hatteras, and you can see it's height at about 200 feet. So almost half, less than ha half the, the height of the lighthouse at Alexandria. We might also wonder, um, what about the light? What kind of light could this lighthouse produce? You know, its job is to help ships coming into the harbor, um, to be a warning beacon, to be a signal, to be a sign that you know, you're approaching the coast, you're approaching um, the city. Uh, and we can also see in the ancient texts or in the text that sometimes the descriptions about its light and how far its light can reach have also been somewhat exaggerated. So we see um, anywhere from 34 miles to 300 miles. Um, in comparison, today, the lighthouse at Cape Hatteras, um, which has a, a very strong light, um, can only be seen on a clear day for 24 nautical miles. So we have to kind of scratch our heads and, and question some of the uh, ancient citations for the distance that the light could be seen. Um, in, a, in modern times, many of our lighthouses uh, today, their lights come by virtue of a Fresnel lens, um, which you see here. Um, the Fresnel lens is able to um, focus the light and provide one steady beam of light. Um, and as the light spins, this beam can um, be done in different patterns. Now, our ancient lighthouse, the Lighthouse of Alexandria, would not have had uh, that type of, um, of operation. We wouldn't have a single beam shooting out of the lighthouse. So representations of the Lighthouse at Alexandria which show one you know, beam of light probably wouldn't uh, necessarily be the case. And certainly there wouldn't be the ability to change the patterns the way our modern lighthouses could. Uh, it seems from reading the, um, you know, looking at the ancient sources that the light um, in the lighthouse was created via a huge fire. The question is, what is the fuel for this fire? If you consider you know, how large the fire had to have been and the fact that it was you know, running almost continuously or at least running all through the night, every night, um, it's a tremendous amount of fuel. And if you think of Egypt and the lack of, of trees uh, there, the, you know, the idea that this is a 
fire fueled by wood is a bit questionable, by charcoal is a bit questionable. Um, some have suggested maybe animal dung uh, is, was burned as a, as a fuel. Um, it seemed that uh, maybe the, the fire would not have to be so big if the, um, if the lighthouse made use of large mirrors to um, direct the light and exaggerate the light. Um, so perhaps there were large um, bronze mirrors at the top uh, that would help um, emanate the, the light forward. And we know, of course, we have many, many examples of small-scale bronze mirrors from ancient Egypt, um, like this example here in our collection. Um, and here is the reflective part, which would have originally been quite polished. So think about something like this on a very enormous, um, enormous scale. We don't have um, any examples of these large bronze reflective mirrors um, from, from Egypt. And so we might wonder, well, what happened to this um, giant mirror? And we have this description that comes to us from a Chinese text that was written in 1225 about the lighthouse at Alexandria, describing the lighthouse, describing um, some of the functioning of the lighthouse. And it says here that at the summit, there was an immense mirror. And this mirror, th the story tells us, um, that could be used not only to provide light to help guide ships in, but could also be used um, to burn up ships in case of an attack, you know, sort of like using a magnifying glass on an ant. Um, and the text further goes on to say that in recent years, there came to Alexandria a foreigner who asked to be given work in the guardhouse below the tower, and he was given some, some jobs to do there. And nobody suspected he would do anything until one day he made off with the mirror um, and then cast it into the sea and, and ran away. And so that you know, sort of tells us how the, the lighthouse perhaps may have stopped beaming its, its light out. Again, this is written in about 1225. So those are some of the descriptions we see of the lighthouse in, um, in texts. Now we can turn to some of the objects that depict um, the lighthouse and see how it may have looked. What you're looking at here is a reconstruction of the pharos at Alexandria that was done in 1909 by a German scholar, and he he read the, the texts, um, and he also looked at um, coins, mosaics, um, and other associated objects depicting the lighthouse in order to come up with this reconstruction, which even until today is, is largely accepted as a, um, a good possibility for how the lighthouse may have originally looked. Just to give you some examples of some of these coins um, minted in Alexandria, um, we have uh, two examples here uh, where the lighthouse is looking very similar, the sort of cylindrical tower um, with a smaller part on top. Notice these elements um, on the sides here and then capped with a figure up above. Uh, also notice this uh, ramp or stairway leading into that high door that was described in the, in the texts. Um, these coins here show again, very similar to the ones we just saw. Um, you have a tower with a smaller element on the top. There are our, our statues. Uh, there's our door, not looking particularly high here. Um, here you have again the door, the statues. Um, and this image is now added to the iconography of the lighthouse, and we'll talk about her and who this figure is um, in a moment. Um, here are a couple of more of, very, of coins. Uh, again, very similar representations of the lighthouse. There's that figure again. Um, here we have the addition of a ship um, on the back of the coin. So the coins, uh, really, for the most part, do sort of agree um, with the depiction of the lighthouse. Um, most of them show a series of figures at the top of the tower. Um, many of the depictions on the coins have these circular um, windows or indentations, um, architectural feature of some kind on the sides of the lighthouse. 
Um, many of them have this raised doorway with steps or a ramp um, leading up to, to the lighthouse. So very much like what we're seeing um, in our um, textual descriptions. This figure uh, that appears on the coins is a representation of the goddess Isis. Um, the goddess Isis in the form of Isis Faria, or Isis of Pharaoh's um, island. And Isis, as you probably know, was one of the most popular um, goddesses in the wider ancient Mediterranean world. So worship of Isis moved from within Egypt um, throughout the, the Mediterranean, and she becomes particularly closely associated with sailors and mariners and um, is prayed to in her form as Isis Faria of a, uh, a, as a protector of, of people on the sea. Um, and so this is what we're seeing here. If we have the figure of Isis. Um, she has basically the same elements we're seeing in this um, statue of Isis here. Um, the, on her head, the same element. She's holding a sistrum, musical instrument. She has the sistrum here, and here she holds a sail um, as if she's controlling uh, the winds in order to protect, uh, protect the sailors. And there is a suggestion that perhaps there was on the island of Pharos, um, adjacent to or near to the lighthouse, um, a temple to Isis Faria. Um, there. And so she would therefore become sort of the lighthouse goddess or the goddess of the, of the lighthouse. And in fact, um, in 1963, there was this very large 10 meter statue of the goddess Isis found in the waters off of um, Pharos Island, not very far from what the original location of Pharos Lighthouse would have been. Um, and it is now on display um, in the city of Alexandria. If you visit, um, you can see this statue. Um, one of the other elements we talked about, we noticed the little figures at the top, and many of our depictions, our illustrations of the lighthouse, show at the very top um, a statue and other sort of associated smaller figures on the lower, the lower levels. The question is, um, who is represented by this, um, this statue. And suggestions have ranged from, um, it's an image of the god Poseidon, makes sense, he's the, the god of the sea, um, an image of Zeus Soter, or Zeus the savior, um, or perhaps it is a representation of um, Zeus's twin sons, Castor and Pollux. Um, and here you see some images of what um, other statues of these individuals look like. And certainly, the depictions of Poseidon and Zeus are very similar um, in their um, appearance and their, um, the staff or the, what would have been the trident in his hands. Uh, the question, the suggestion that perhaps it's a figure of uh, Castor and Pollux comes from this inscription that was supposedly on the lighthouse there um, that we looked at before um, that is on behalf of mariners to the divine saviors. Normally, it is the sons of Zeus, Castor and Pollux, who are referred to as the divine saviors. So this is why the suggestion is made. Um, but if, if people don't want it to be Castor and Pollux and would prefer it to be Poseidon or Zeus, um, you can also say, well, this reference to the divine saviors is not referring to these twin gods, but are rather referring to the Ptolemaic king, Ptolemy Soter I, um, and his wife, Bernice, or Bernike, um, who are referred to as the savior gods. So um, we don't really have a, a definitive answer there, but there are a couple of possibilities. Turning from our coins, representations of Pharaohs on coins, we see um, a couple of examples of terracotta lamps from the Greco-Roman period that are done in the shape of a lighthouse. Um, so you have this example here. Note the three, um, three, tower, three elements to the tower, um, the figure on top, and this here, which is a little bit um, less um, clear uh, and has an accompanying figure of the god Pan. 
Um, there is also not far from um, Alexandria, uh, the, the site of Top Osiris, um, and there at the site there was this monument constructed, seems to be um, roughly contemporary with uh, the, the lighthouse and perhaps it was a tomb built in the model of or in the style of the lighthouse, it's been suggested. When we look at um, examples in mosaics, we can see from the fourth century um, this mosaic showing the a pharaoh, so showing a lighthouse. Here's our, um, our ramp or our stairway up to the high door. Here we have a couple of different levels, and here our statue at the top of Zeus or Poseidon or the, the savior gods there. Um, this uh, mosaic comes, was found in, in Libya. And one of the latest depictions of the Pharaoh's lighthouse can be seen in the mosaics in St. Mark's Cathedral in Venice. St. Mark was the saint who was reported to have brought Christianity to Egypt. So in this mosaic, we see a boat um, carrying a figure, well, carrying St. Mark, identified here, he has this halo, and he is approaching Egypt, approaching the city of Alexandria, and what he is being greeted with is a depiction of the lighthouse at Alexandria, is the pharaohs. Um, again, we have our high door, we have our windows that we see on the coins, um, the different levels, and the top, we're, we're missing our, our statue um, at the very top. So, We've looked at it in text, we've looked at some representations that are contemporary with the lifespan of the lighthouse. We might then ask, well, what happened to it? You know, wh where did it go? We have one of the wonders, the, the, the Great Pyramid is still standing in Egypt, what happened to, to the lighthouse? Well, we know um, that it was still standing, still there in 1225. Um, that's when we have that, the story of the person who stole uh, the mirror and threw it into the sea. We have reports from the traveler Ibn Battuta who visited Alexandria in 1326, and he describes at that visit that the lighthouse is in partial ruin. He then comes back to Alexandria about 20 years later, and his next report is that it's entirely in ruin, and that it's not possible to enter the lighthouse, to climb up to the lighthouse anymore, that it is essentially destroyed. Um, it seems that the destruction of the lighthouse happened as a result of a series of earthquakes. We know from um, records both by classical authors and by Arab writers that there were at least um, 22 earthquakes of considerable size, size enough to warrant mention in text. And we know that there are certain points in the lighthouse's history where destruct or damage to the lighthouse is recorded. So we see in 796, the lighthouse lost its upper story. We see between 950 and 956 that cracks appear in the masonry of the lighthouse and that the tower begin, it lost some more of its height. Um, we see another earthquake happening in 1261, bringing more damage. We also see records in these texts of um, attempts to repair, restore the lighthouse um, by uh, various individuals. So in, in, seven, in 1272, uh, Saladin ordered restoration work done to the lighthouse. In 1303, there is a massive earthquake that hits the Mediterranean basin, and effects of that, that earthquake are felt in Egypt, in Greece, um, they're felt, felt all over the area, and Alexander, Alexandria is very badly affected by this earthquake. And this earthquake um, is probably what leads to the destruction that is seen by Ibn Battuta in 1326. Um, and we do see after the earthquake of 1303, um, descriptions in the text how people in the city, the, the leaders of the city, had to spend a lot of time, a lot of effort, a lot of money repairing damaged buildings within the city, um, including and the, the lighthouse is mentioned, and even the lighthouse is, is repaired as part of this. And so, as I said before, in 13. 
49, when Ibn Battuta comes back to Alexandria, there is, the lighthouse is destroyed. So that is essentially the end of the, the lifespan of the, of the lighthouse as a tower, as a beacon, as a, um, a tall standing structure. Um, and there are, of course, wonderful depictions in art of this destruction of the lighthouse, this dramatic crashing into the sea of the lighthouse as a result of um, some of these earthquakes. Or there's an alternative um, explanation. You, uh, you know, Godzilla apparently was the one that ate the lighthouse. It's only $18 on eBay, it's a steal. That isn't, in fact, though, the end of the history of the lighthouse. Um, about a hundred and some odd years after um, Ibn Battuta had visited and saw it in ruin, we see the construction of this building here, uh, the Citadel of Cape Bay. Um, which was built in 1477. And this citadel is located in the exact spot where the lighthouse of Alexandria stood originally. And so it is entirely possible that this fortress, the citadel, is constructed of stone partially from the original lighthouse building or constructed on top of foundation stones that were part of the original lighthouse um, construction. Um, and so here you see an image of the, the citadel, the fort of Cape Bay, and here um, its location, exactly where the Pharaoh's lighthouse was. Um, and this brings us to um, more recent underwater investigations in and around uh, the area of Pharaoh's Island, um, in and around the, the area of Cape Bay Fort, um, there, have, there have been um, quite a number of seasons done by French underwater archaeologists um, who have located underwater elements that they believe were part of the original construction of the Pharaoh's lighthouse. Um, and these are um, in this area here. Um, and so, you know, if it's going to be toppling into the sea, um, this is a pretty, a pretty good bet. Um, as part of these underwater excavations in and around this area, not only are they finding um, elements that they believe were part of the original lighthouse construction, they're also finding incredible um, statuary from the, the Ptolemaic period of various um, Egyptian kings and queens, um, and even statuary from earlier periods that were reused um, in Alexandria. So here's some of the images of these uh, statues. Here's part of an obelisk um, uncovered. Uh, here are some of these enormous blocks that are believed to be part of uh, the original pharaoh's construction. And I think some estimates put these blocks at about 75 tons so, a piece. So there's no um, indication, there's no plan to bring these blocks up and try and do a reconstruction of the lighthouse. Um, but this area where these blocks have been identified has been marked as a, a, a you know, put on the World Heritage List for protection um, so that nothing, you know, can damage uh, these remains under the sea there. Just to put it in perspective, um, our Sphinx, with whom I am intimately connected at this point, um, he originally weighed, he weighs probably about 13 tons. So just to give you, know, if you've seen our Sphinx, you can see the size of that block and then think about something that's 75 tons and just how enormous that would be. Uh, here are just some more images of the blocks underwater. And another of the large um, royal statues uh, as part of those underwater excavations. Uh, so that sort of brings me to the end of my description of the Pharos Lighthouse. If you look um, at this chart of some of the wonders of the ancient world, um, the Great Pyramid, of course, is our, our longest lived, um, even standing till today, um, our earliest of the, the great wonders of the ancient world. Um, but the Lighthouse of Alexandria, its lifespan is pretty healthy in comparison with some of the others here. So um, almost the second or perhaps the third longest lived of all of the um, ancient wonders. Um, and it is pretty incredible when you think about the lighthouse. Um, when you think about its inclusion on this list, when you think about the fact that it lasted from, you know, the about 280 BC all the way until 
1347, whenever the, the final collapse happened. Um, and when we think about how the, the weather actually can be um, in Alexandria, we think of Egypt as being warm and sunny and, and, and nice. Um, but in actual fact, winters in Alexandria can be quite rough and can be quite, um, quite dangerous. The sea can be quite rough. And so the fact that this lighthouse in that position on Faroes Island lasted as long as it did is kind of amazing. Um, and this is a view from January of a, a snowstorm um, that occurred in Alexandria, just to show you that there is bad weather in Egypt too. Um, and so here are just a final um, reconstruction, suggested reconstruction done in 2006 um, that looks very much like the one done in, in 1909, a few tweaks done to it. Um, when the, the work by the German author in 1909 was done, um, the manuscript with the very full description of uh, the lighthouse with all the measurements wasn't known yet, so he didn't have those measurements to work with. This reconstruction takes that into consideration. It's also interesting, I think, that there is um, today a, a lighthouse in Alexandria. So if you went to Alexandria and said, where is the lighthouse of Alexandria? Um, some people might say, well, it's gone. And you could say, no, no, there actually there is a lighthouse there. There is the Ras Al Tin light, um, or Alexandria light. Um, it has a height of about 180 feet. It was built in 1848, and it is located right here. So in a very different spot from our um, lighthouse in, uh, of Alexandria, of the, of the pharaohs. So that is the end of my discussion, but I was asked to put in a little commercial plug at the end of my talk for an upcoming event that the museum is having, our Egyptomania Day, which will take place on Saturday, March 21st. Um, it will include a whole day of uh, fun activities for families, um, talks, lectures, workshops that will be going on. I will be giving a talk about um, Egypto, Egyptomania, Egyptian kitsch, um, the view of Egypt in uh, the modern, modern world or reinterpretation of it. Um, and also uh, on this, at this, um, during this day um, will be the first public talk by uh, Joe Wagner um, about the latest forensic discoveries of Pharaoh Setebkai, the, the newly discovered Pharaoh um, that was discovered last season um, at Abydos last winter. Um, this past winter, we had a, a group of um, forensic uh, specialists out there with us who examined the skeletal remains and came up with some really fascinating information. And so Joe will be presenting this information um, on the 21st, and I believe the scheduled time is 2 p.m., but you might want to check the website for uh, that to make sure. So thank you very much.